Robin Hood Radio and the Robin Hood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. Welcome to Leonard Lopate at Large. I'm Leonard Lopate. Michael Rosenblum is a television producer and video journalist who built the first major video-driven local TV news operation at New York One. He later went on to train video journalists at Voice of America, the New York Times, the BBC, German Public TV, and Dutch Public TV, and he was both the founder and first president of New York Times Television. His production company, Rosenblum TV, offers boot camps for people who want to learn how to become video journalists. And he's written a book called iPhone Millionaire. It's from McGraw-Hill, and it offers a detailed roadmap to creating best-selling television programs. And I'm very pleased that it brings him to our show today. Hi. Hi, Leonard. Thanks for the invitation. So that's a a, a storied career. Where did it begin? Well, (laughs) it began in Newark, New Jersey at WNET 13. I was a production secretary slicing bagels and making coffee for everyone. That was my first job. So the equivalent of an intern. Yes, I would say so. And um, before that, when I was at school, I had, I had gotten a thing called a Watson Foundation Fellowship from IBM, and I spent three years traveling around the world photographing. I always wanted to be a photojournalist, but difficult to make a living. Did, did they teach journalism in that way in those days? No, and certainly not at Williams, where I went. They, when I, they said, this is not a trade school. <laughs> so <laughs> adamant about it. But when I started, I started to work at Channel 13, and because it was in Newark and sort of out of it, they left me alone, so I was able to grab the crews there and start to make mini documentaries. I think I won six or seven Emmys in the first five years, local. And then uh, I got hired by uh, Charlie Carrault at, uh, at Sunday morning, and I was a producer there for two years, and I just, I thought it was a waste of time. I thought it was sort of fraudulent. As the producer, you go out, you do all the stories, you find the people, you, of course, you had to go with the cameraman and the crew and all that stuff. And then the, the and you and in those days you had to have a camera, a oh, camera oh, person. Absolutely, with you. you weren't ever doing I, your I, own camera. I got, you know, I started as a photographer. I got so annoyed once I grabbed the camera from the camera and I said, "Let me shoot that myself." I got this huge warning and a fine and <laughs> yelled at. <laughs> well, and, that's, you were probably breaking union oh, rules you over, all the time. And 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 also then you know I mean most of the show I mean, it's a lovely show, but it's basically fraudulent the way networks work. Producer does all the work, and the talent shows up at the last minute. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you win a script. A, a script that you wrote. And then he's making a million dollars, and you're making 50000 And then at the Emmy Awards, they go, I want to thank all the people who helped on this. Mm-hmm. I thought, screw it. So I quit. And, of course, my family thought I was out of my mind. Are you crazy? And Fred Friendly was my mentor at that time. He thought, best network in the world. You're crazy. Mm-hmm. And I bought myself a little home video camera. I couldn't afford a beta cam. And I wanted to see if I could make television the way photojournalists worked at Magnum. So I went to live in a Palestinian refuge camp in the Gaza Strip, a place called Jabalia, during the first Intifada. And I moved in with a Palestinian family, and I lived there for a month. And they didn't uh, notice that your name was Rosenblum? Well, actually, <laughs> they, I think the first two weeks they were a little nervous. There was a woman named Mrs. Shawa. The Shawa is one of the dominant families in Gaza. And she sort of vetted me. I had to live in her house for a week before they let me go to Jabalia. And I had tea, and I, she was very genteel. And at the end of the week, she turned to me and says, you're a Jew, but I trust you. <laughs> and then b- with her blessing, I was able to get into Jabalia. That's how I did it. So I shot video. It was hard to get into these camps? It's hard to get trusted. I mean, uh-huh. the people don't trust anybody. But during the Intifada, of course, all the networks were driving down from Tel Aviv every day with the Israeli film crews and, and you know, standing up on the edge of Erez checkpoint. And all well, the Palestinian kids knew at 2 o'clock they'd go out and throw rocks for the B-roll. And then they'd all go home. So, yeah, so, well, d- did you? Uh, how did your family back home feel? Oh, they thought about I was all nuts. They thought, they thought was you were nuts too. Crazy, risky life. Well, but did it, did it feel dangerous? No, not in the least. No, no. I've been in war zones all the time. I, I never felt any sense of. I felt safe. In fact, and, you know, later on when I went to the Khmer Rouge and stuff like that, all the hotels are empty. The restaurants are happy to see you. Everybody's very friendly. <laughs> so anyway, I lived with the family for a month, and I shot video every day, and they gave me great access. You know, they. Somebody would be shot in a, in a riot, and they would go, wait, Mike, come with us. They'd get in the ambulance. We'd go to the hospital. and It's terrific stuff. 
So I came back to New York. Wait, wait, but yeah. Yeah, and you were sending this back to? No, no, no. I, no, you, there was no sending back. I was just accumulating tapes. We shot tape in those days. And uh, at the end of a month, I came back to New York with my pile of tapes. And um, I went to see Les Crystal at the McNeil Lira News Hour. I, I didn't really know him. And I said, Mr. Crystal, I got some stuff. So he looked at it. And the fact is, I got such good access that, you know, when they set a crew and a reporter, and they're there for a minute and they leave. So he bought two pieces from me for $50,000. And that for me, that was great. I made 50 grand in, in one month, and I had a good time. And had he sent, you know, a crew and a reporter and a producer and the airfares and hotels, it would have cost him a fortune. But so. were you competing with the the networks that sent crews? Uh, yeah, could yeah, you get stuff that they couldn't oh, get? Oh, absolutely. They, they, they're very frightened, most of these guys. You know, they would show up with an Israeli military escort to begin with. They generally had crews that were from Israel, and they'd drive down from Tel Aviv. They were staying at the Intercontinental. They would appear for a couple of hours, shoot some B-roll, and stand up and go home. It was terrible. So I got some real in-depth stuff. And I always wanted to see if you could make television the way Magnum did photography, you know, with a much more interest in the intimacy that, mm -hmm. that little cameras. You know, the breakthrough, with, I mean, it's, it's kind of a departure, but the breakthrough with photojournalism was when Leicas first arrived because they were small and people get very intimate. And that's the kind of shooting I was able to do with a little video camera. It's kind of intimidating when somebody is shooting you with one of those big cameras yes. that they yes. had on their yes. shoulders. And of course, you show up with five people mm -hmm. and a light and you take control. I've seen it a million times. And so, how much of the Intifada were you able to capture? Oh, a lot. I got a lot because I got, well... You know, the best journalism, as you know, is personal stories. As Fred Friendly said, small stories work the best. And because I live with a family, and I had this fantastic access, I got really intimate, great stories. So Les bought the stuff, and they put it on the air. They were a little annoyed because Les's wife was the head of yeah, Hadassah. <laughs> so they the most positive thing in the world. But it was, it was very... They were concerned that you were sympathetic I to was sympathetic. I was sympathetic to the Palestinians, yeah. And, and they didn't like that at all. So... After that, I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. So I went to Cambodia during the election, Funsenpec, and I was able to get in the north where the Khmer Rouge was still there, and I shot a video there, and I took it back. And Then I just started to travel around the world doing these things. Ted Koppel, I found Ted at Nightline, and I went to Uganda. I spent three months in Uganda finding the index case for AIDS in the CC Islands, hmm. and Ted gave me a whole half-hour, hour, I don't know what it was, on Nightline for my stuff. And I probably would have continued with that. It was... A, Today, everybody goes and shoots video. In those days, it was a radically different idea. You also uh, went to Afghanistan. Yeah. So you're, yeah. you're traveling around the Middle East. Yes. Uh, was it dangerous to be in those places by yourself no. without the support no. of a news agency? No. Well, first of all, I speak Arabic. I mean, I'm not fluent, but I speak enough to get by. And that made a big difference. Had you studied Arabic? Yeah. Or did you just pick it up? <laughs> no, no, no. I spent two years at NYU in the Kivorkian Center. I was a, a graduate student in Islamic studies, ironically. Mm -hmm. Last week, I spoke to a war correspondent who said that the adrenaline rush can be addictive. He said he courted risks. Were you looking mm, for stories no, where I that might happen? No, you know, there are bang-bang guys in the business. I wasn't interested in the bang-bang. I was interested in the personal stories. So I'll tell you a great story. I was, I was in Israel during the Intifada, and I was actually in the north, um, outside of uh, Haifa. There's a Palestinian community. And I was there with my little camera shooting, and suddenly these kids came. I had teenagers started throwing rocks at me, you know, and Yehud and all this kind of stuff. And I kind of backed into the corner. I was a little nervous, so I turned to them, and I, I, I said, it's a quote from the Quran, it's the last surah. I said, Kul audu nas, 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 was achanas, Which means don't listen to the whispering of the devil in your breast. Mm. And they stopped like that, and they went, Quran. <laughs> and I went, Ewa, Quran. And they said, Inti Muslim. I said, Are you a Muslim? I said, La, ana Yehudi. Go, a Jew who reads from the Quran is unbelievable. So they grabbed me and they took me into this apartment and they sat me down and this old guy came out and he opened the Quran in front of me. He said, Ikra, it's the command form. You read. Mm -hmm. I gotta read. So I said, Bismillah, Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbi, Rabbi. Suddenly the doors opened up. These girls came in with, wine, with, with, with tea and honey cakes and I was their best friend. Well, they appreciated the fact that it's, he, you yeah. actually had made the effort well, it's part of this whole rap about reporting as a video journalist versus going as a crew and a journalist. You go by yourself, and you embed yourself into the community, and that makes an enormous difference for reporting. But you couldn't use your Arabic when you went to Afghanistan. No, no, they speak Urdu and Farsi, but it didn't make any difference. You know, memorizing swaths of the Quran gets you, even with taxi drivers in New York, <laughs> gets you a lot of distance <laughs> even to this day. Oh, I'll have to try. <laughs> but uh, so what happened in Afghanistan? How long did you spend? did you spend there? I, I think I went there for Sandy Sokolow for the Christian Science Monitor. 
And I was, th- I was only in Kabul on Chicken Street, but I, I, you know, it was, the country was falling apart. I guess the Russians had already left. So the country was just sort of unraveling. But Sandy, I lived in Paris for several years, and I was the Middle East mm-hmm. reporter for Christian Science Monitor. So Sandy would send me around to all kinds of strange places, but I didn't spend a lot of time there. Well, Kabul could be dangerous as well because every so often somebody, some suicide bomber. Yeah, would but that's what made the hotels empty and the restaurants so happy to see you. <laughs> so in, in that case, uh, you didn't have, you, you never embedded with military No, I, I'm not a big fan of it. To me, that's kind of propaganda. I, I'm, I much prefer embedding with regular people. So what do you think you learned in those places? I think I learned how to be a journalist for the first time, even though I had been a producer at CBS. I'd gone to Columbia Journalism School and that kind of stuff. To me, journalism, it's a very personal view of the way regular people see the world. It was a very different kind of reporting, and I've tried to do that in all the stuff that I did ever since. Isn't the problem, uh, I've spoken to other journalists about this, other foreign correspondents, that we still see these places through the filter of Western eyes? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, th- and the people there are seeing a different world. Yes, and well, you not only see it through the f- filter of Western eyes, you also see it through the filter of media corporations that have to make a profit. And they only make a profit by airing scary stuff. Oh, so you're saying, oh, this is going to be great footage. Yeah, of course. It's, it's you know, if it bleeds, it leads thing. So if you look at the news every night, it's a terrorist attack or a plane crash. Or, you know, th- their job is to scare the wits out of people so they keep watching. But it, it warps our perception of what the world and what other people are like. Uh, and how long did you keep on doing this? I did it this for... This was kind of freelance? Yes, yeah, so I was completely freelance, but I was having fun. I was making a nice living. I was still living in my walk up in Brooklyn. I was having... And when Brooklyn was not a great neighborhood. And uh, then uh, this Swedish billionaire named Jan Stenbeck found me. Uh, he's... If you ever read The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, he's mm-hmm. in the book. He's the only real person in the book because Stieg Larsson worked for one of his magazines. And Stenbeck was starting the first commercial television network in Scandinavia. And... He understood the economics of what I had done, which I never really thought about. But I'd gotten rid of the cameraman, the soundman, the producer, the other, and the stuff looked good. So he flew me to Stockholm and he asked me the seminal life-changing question. He said to me, can you teach other people to do this? And I said, any idiot can do this. <laughs> so I came back to Brooklyn, and then about a, a month later, his lawyer, Michael Tannen, called me. And he said, Mr. Stenbeck wants to start a company with you. He'll capitalize it with a million dollars and give you 30% equity. Are you interested? <laughs> Sign it. So I had to go to Stockholm. I lived in Stockholm for two years, and we started to build television stations based on my little model. The first one I did was in Bergen, Norway. So I went to Bergen, and I found 30 young journalists, basically from university, and I had to be on the air in a month. So I had to create a curriculum that would teach people to make perfect television journalism every single time by themselves. And so we developed all these techniques. Which includes editing? Yes. Well, in those days, you edited on, in those days we edited on these RM450 decks. You didn't have mm-hmm. laptops yet, but just edited. They shot. I think editing your own material is critical because otherwise you don't have a feel for what you've done. So they shot, they edited, they script, they reported, they did everything. And TV Bergen was so successful. We did TV3 Norway, TV3 Sweden, TV3. And then um, uh, Time Warner was first starting um, New York One, and they called me up and they said, we want to do a 24-hour channel in, in New York. And uh, we'd like to use your method if you're interested. So I came to New York, and um, we did New York One. We set up New York One based on that. And New York One was a huge success. And then we did Channel One in London, and we did Switzerland. The thing just sort of took off. Well, and the, the, your approach, of course, now uh, we, it's the approach that everybody uses. Yes. But for New York One, that was a real breakthrough because they could cover the, the yes. fire in in Jersey City yes. and then uh, yes. the the, it, uh, the car crash in, it, in yes. Brownsville. It, I, 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 Paul Sagan, I give him enormous credit. When I first met him, he was running it. And he said, how many video journalists would you have? I said, everyone in the building should be like in the New York Times. Everyone knows how to write. And he said, how many crews would you have? And I said, none. And much to his credit, he stepped up and we did that. And the funny thing is the model is so successful. I just came back from Los Angeles where we set up Spectrum One, which is the same mm-hmm. thing. It's a 24-hour Entirely the same model. Spectrum is Time Warner, isn't it? Yes, it is now. Charter bought it. But we we did Spectrum 1 LA, and they're going to do nine more stations like this across the country. So the thing, it works very well. When I went to the BBC, I spent five years at the BBC. When I went to the BBC, there were 64 camera crews that covered the UK for the BBC. And I trained 1,400 BBC staffers to shoot and cut to every other camera. BBC has a lot of money. 
So when we finished, instead of putting 64 crews out, we put 1,464 mm -hmm. crews out every day. This gave television journalism something it doesn't normally have, which I'd say is the fail freedom to fail. If you work in television news and there are eight crews like there are at WCBS, you get up in the morning, you read the newspaper, you do that story because it has to work. You only have a limited time. Well, people are listening to police reports and they go rushing off to yes. some place where, in this case, you had a lot more flexibility. Well, what makes print journalism so powerful is a print journalist will go to their editor and say, I have this idea, I'm not sure if it works, and they'll say, well, you need a pencil, go. And in television, you can't do that. But at the BBC, suddenly we could do it. I'm speaking with uh, Michael Rosenblum. Uh, this is Leonard Lopez at Large at WBAI, New York, 99.5 FM. Okay, so here you are. You're working for Voice of America, the New York One, Voice of America, the New York Times. You're teaching people in Dutch television, German television, uh, Swedish television. Uh, does everybody want the same sort of thing, or did it, would... Uh, They'd be looking for different uh, kinds that's of a, stories. That's a very I'm, I'm question. really interested yeah. in what's news in a different country it's a or very, for, for, a different, uh, uh, for a different company. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question because most television news, and you still see it in American networks today, it's cookie cutter. All the pieces look exactly the same. But once we're empowered journalists and we freed them from the producer and the cameraman and the, the necessity to make air, we introduced the notion of authorship. And so... People could begin to make stories the, that they liked, that they thought were interesting, the way they wanted to do it. And particularly in, in Sweden and Norway and Germany, we found a lot more liberal approaches to freeing the journalists to making the kind. And some worked and some didn't work, which is fine. Did you get any pushback from the the older generation? Oh, I got you go to a website called broll.net. I got death threats from <laughs> unions and cameramen. Of course, people used to call me up and say, "I'm going to kill you if you come here. You're taking my job. I have kids. I have a mortgage." Sam, it's not me. It's the technology. You should learn how to do this yourself. You obviously were telling them that they should quit. You were saying... Uh, no, no, no. I, you time know, marches on. They're well, the funny thing is that most cameramen, these old-school cameramen, they're much better journalists than the 22-year-old the, the, the reporters they drag around. And I've seen a million times where the cameraman will go, okay, ask this question out of this. They say to the cameraman, you don't need the reporter. For them, some of them got it, and some of them got annoyed, and some of them sent me nasty notes, but... You know, it, it was technology drove the transformation. And what kinds of cameras were you teaching people to use at well, that time? Originally, in the very first, when we did New York One, we did Hi8, which is a high-end home oh. video camera. And, it was, you know, and again, for, for Sagan, I give him credit because it was really on the edge of being broadcast quality or not. Of course, all the technical people said there's compression in the blacks. And hmm. I said to Paul, no viewer at home ever changed the channel because there's compression in the blacks. I don't really care. And then, of course, Mini DV that's, came and along. And that's before HD TV. Oh, way before HD. And so then Mini DV came along, and, and um, uh, Sony, uh, Mr. Idei, who was the chairman and CEO of Sony, glommed onto what I was doing and flew me to Japan to meet with him. And he really wanted to get ahead of this thing. So they brought out these Mini DV cameras. They called it the VJ cam in the beginning, which I was delighted with. And I helped consult with them on how to design the camera. Small, but it had to have really, really good audio. We had uh, XLR, two XLR inputs, but a little tiny camera. But those cameras were only available to people in journalism? No, no, anybody could buy them. I mean, I it, could have gone into a camera store yes. and gotten one? Yeah. I mean, the, the, they were expensive, but not, not a, a beta camera is $50,000. A mini DV camera is about 1200 so it wasn't mm -hmm. terrible. Then you also trained staff at the United Nations. Yeah, we, um, the United Nations approached us, and they were annoyed because they spent their lives trying to convince CNN to go to Darfur. And, of course, for CNN, it's expensive, and they've sent a crew, and who really cares about refugees and all that kind of stuff. So um, the UN, we talked to the UN, and um, we said, uh, well, we can train your staff. You don't really need CNN. It was now the Internet. It was, you don't need CNN anymore. This was kind of a revelation for them. So we did a pilot project with them in Geneva. They're very smart, the people who worry. This is UNHCR, the High Commission on Refugees. And uh, we went to Geneva twice, and we trained two groups of 40. Of course, they did fantastic stuff. So they came back, and, and of course, I wanted to get the contract. And my wife, who's also my business partner, was uh, nervous because I'll say anything to get a contract. So we were <laughs> sitting in Geneva in their offices, and I said, they said, well, will this work in difficult places? They said, we will go to the most difficult place you have to prove this. And they turned out, okay, Somalia. <laughs> she looked at me, she goes, we're going to get killed. Well, Somalia turned out to be too dangerous, but we went to Nairobi. 
and uh, we started training all the African uh, UNHCR. I think we've trained about 165 UNHCR operatives now to tell their own stories. And if you go to their website, their, their stories are fantastic. So when I am watching a, a news show and I see some footage from some faraway place, yes. there's a good chance that somebody is doing using the techniques that you were teaching at Could the time be. or an updated version of them? Could be. I mean, we have a very, very rigorous way of teaching people how to shoot. And and when we start, I always tell, we run these boot camps, and on the first day of the boot camp, even though we have people who have been in the business for 30 years, I say to them, you have to forget everything you know, and from now on, the only thing you know is what I tell you. And if I didn't tell it to you, it doesn't exist. So I can spot my technique. We've trained about 50,000 people now, so I can spot my technique. So in this case, we're talking about cameras. Then along comes the smartphone. Yes, that's the real revolution. Because now everyone, every single person who has a smartphone, an iPhone or a Galaxy, has in their pocket the equivalent of about $10 million of professional gear from a couple of years ago. You have a 4K camera, high def, absolute broadcast quality. You have an edit system. If you download or you get iMovie or something like that, you can put in music, you can put in graphics, and you can live stream and share it with anywhere in the world. It's absolutely astonishing. You just have to learn how to hold your hand steady. Well, that's easy because you only have to hold it steady for 10 seconds, so anybody can do that. The, it, can we say that this has democratized the yes. news? Because uh, we wouldn't have footage of many of the things that we see in the TV news these days if people weren't on the scene and say and deciding maybe I should shoot this in my camera. It's it's it has democratized it, but nowhere to the extent that I think it should have or will. Places like CNN, they had a thing called I Report, you know, where, where people could do it. And I think they had a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand people to sign up for I Report. But all they're really interested in is if a tornado hits your trailer, take out your phone and, and send it to us. To me, this is just using a new technology to do the same old stuff. But we've also seen uh, footage of shootings. We've seen... Uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's, see, the problem is the Car game, accidents, yeah. all sorts of things where people just yes. take out their phone. Yes. No question that, that you can do more stuff. But the gatekeeper here is still the media corporations. I read somewhere that... 90 or 95 percent of what you see in the media is controlled by six major corporations and their interest is in profit so even if you go i i did an interesting experiment in in brooklyn uh this year uh last year and um we went to brownsville in east new york which is probably one of the most underserved communities and the people in brownsville in new york their the impression that New Yorkers have when they see WCBS or WSC is that these are very dangerous neighborhoods because the only thing you see is crime and robbery and fire. Every night it's a fire, a robbery, a murder. The funny thing is that for the vast majority of viewers, those stories are abstractions. Unless your house is the one that burned down, it doesn't mean anything, but they get viewers. So places like East New York and Brownsville, they suffer from this footprint of violence. And your perception when I say, I'm going to East New York, and you say, I'm going to Harlem, people go, are you out of your mind? You're going to get killed because you think it's violent. So I went out to East New York, and we had a, a, a meeting at the local junior high school. I worked with an organization called Man Up, which is a terrific community organization. And we got 150 people from the community to meet at George Gershwin Junior High School one evening. And I said, who here thinks the community gets a terrible perception? Everybody raised their hands. 150 people raised their hand. And I said, who here would like to change the perception? Everybody raised their hand. I said, mm -hmm. who here has ideas for stories about the community you think would be great? Everybody raised their hand. I said, who here has an iPhone or a smartphone? Everybody raised their hand. I said, mm -hmm. we have 150 professional broadcast cameras now. We have 150 camera crews. We're going to do this. So Lisa, my wife Lisa, and I ran um, boot camps for them for free for about six months and taught them to shoot and cut and tell stories. And my intention was to create a local television station for the community. So... Once we got them, and we got some, I mean, some of it was junk, some of it was good. It was a mix like anything else. Some of it was fantastic. Uh, one of our participants, Simon Style, uh, Samson Stiles, he, he was a, a fascinating guy. He did a documentary about growing up in the projects, and he had been shot, and he went to jail, and he reconciled with the guy who shot him. It was a beautiful piece. He just sold his documentary film to a, a Revolt, which is Puff Daddy's thing, and he actually just came back from South Africa doing a tour with it. So I'm, I'm a big fan, not of of doing TV news with smartphones, which is what most networks want to do, because it's cheap. I'm a big fan of empowering people to tell the stories that they want to tell. It's very different.
Well, hasn't it also brought us conspiracy theories, white nationalist blogs, yeah. trolls, yeah. all sorts of other things, it, uh, this yeah. democratization? Yeah. Free press is supposed to be messy. That's how it works. We like a free press to be messy. The problem with television in gen specifically is that we've never had a free press in television because everything was controlled by these corporations. Now, for the first time ever, we're beginning to get the glimmerings of a free press, and it has a much broader a smorgasbord of stuff. And like in the world... Of, We've been in the world of print, free press and print, for 500 years since Gutenberg. And we're adjusted to a, a free press in print. When you go to the supermarket and you see a tabloid that says, 500-pound boy found on Mars, you don't go running home and go, oh, my God, did you see what happened on Mars? You discount it. Because we're used to messy press. Yeah, except that that same newspaper also printed Hillary having a heart attack. Yeah, but we all, I mean, I don't know about you, but I look at the National Enquirer and go, I don't even bother. So... We're very if good. If you're Jeff Bezos, you bother. Yeah, well, that's another story. But we're very good at discounting what is works and what doesn't work. We're terrible at it in, in video and television because we're so used to television being controlled by NBC and CBS, and obviously everything they say is true. Most of it is not true. So look at Fox News. I mean, most of it is not true. It's in, in nonsense. But, and the Internet also. We're still, the Internet's so new, we look at something on the Internet and go, must be true, because I saw it on the Internet. Where, in fact... 99% of it is, is just nonsense. But we'll get more sophisticated as more people start to make stuff. Well, in your case, you shot things that you thought were interesting, going back to the Intifada. Yes. And then uh, people found it interesting and wound yes. up using it. If I um, decided that I wanted to shoot things of, uh, on a certain topic, yes. is it possible for me to just to have my own show or of to create or of to... Course. Go to some. Uh, where would I go? Well, first you, you would take my boot camp next month. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that. There are a few spaces bit. left. Um, you would do as you know. If you were a writer and you wanted to write a novel or you want to write a book, you know, we would say write what you know about. And I would say the mm -hmm. same thing with video. Take the video camera and make something that you know about. The, the and then who do I bring it to? Well, you just is, told yes, me that yes. there's kind of a, a closed world. Yes, uh, it, it, for them it's a closed world. The the confluence of of smartphones that shoot broadcast quality video and give you that power and an internet that allows you to put it out to three and a half billion people, people for free. People on the YouTube. Yes, the well YouTube mm -hmm. or other places. The barrier to entry is gone. The, the problem is uh, monetizing because my favorite expression is if there's no revenue, there's no journalism. Mm -hmm. The revenue has to come first. But if you were to create a channel, your own channel, I mean, I mean Reed Hastings did great with, with Netflix, but he shows old movies. But if you wanted to create the Leonard Lopate channel, and you probably, you know, and it's an interesting idea, you have enough followers. You're getting me all excited here. Well, you, you could do it. I mean, you could do it. And part of it would be commercial. But I always say to people who want to get in this business, it's fantastic to enhance a product that you have already. So, you know, if you do lectures or you, you know, you go speak and you charge for it and stuff like that, having a channel. And then if you've got enough viewers on your channel, then we could begin to sell commercial time. And. I mean, I, I'm sure the people at WBI are lovely, but we could start a channel together, and I'll take 10%, and it's not a problem. <laughs> there are a couple of places out there that are already doing that yes. sort of thing. Yes, it's the very beginning. I, I always make the analogy to the invention of the printing press. The printing press changed the nature of print in the world, and, and, and now we are about, if printing press was 1450, I'd say we're about 1475. We're just at the beginning of this. Somebody actually approached me uh, a while back about doing a TV show mm -hmm. of this sort, but uh, then all of the technological stuff suddenly fell on my shoulders, and I'm an old guy. Uh, you read, you got my book, I read it. <laughs> yes. But this is before I saw your book. Okay. When I when well, I text, I don't use both thumbs. I use one finger pointing. I, I do which also. Is, I do the same thing. You I'm can always bad. tell how old a person is I'm whether they're bad, pointing with I'm a very finger bad or with doing texting. their thumbs. It takes me forever. So and in fact, I, I, I was intimidated and I decided still, not I, to do that. I still write on a manual typewriter when I was. So oh, do you? I'm very old. But um, the, all you need is a phone, and the phone will shoot video. It'll edit it, put the music, put the graphics, and it will share it with the entire world for free. I mean, you need a website. Uh, or you could put it on YouTube or any other place you want to put it. The, the fact is it costs so little to do, it doesn't take much before it becomes profitable. I'm speaking with Michael Rosenblum. who mentioned his book. It's called iPhone Millionaire, How to Create and Sell Cutting-Edge Video, and it's published by McGraw-Hill. Uh, subtitle, Six Weeks to Change Your Life with the World's Greatest Gadget. Yeah, I guess that's McGraw Hill did that time. Oh, they they, they, they gave it. Yes, that was yeah. their idea. Uh, 
This is Leonard Lopez at Large on, and we are back with Michael Rosenblum, whose uh, book, which came out in 2013, 13, 13, yes. is iPhone Millionaire, How to Create and Sell Cutting-Edge Video. Uh, have you had to d- update it, or is well, it pretty no, much the we, same? We have a new book coming out soon uh, called Screen Nation, but probably next year. Next year. Yeah. But have things changed a lot over the, the last six years? Mm, I think that... Not that much, actually. The, the iPhone was the big breakthrough, and that has not really changed. The phones have gotten somewhat better. The cameras have gotten somewhat better. The, the broad and they've gotten more expensive as well. Yes, they've gotten more expensive, but you don't have to buy such an expensive one to shoot video. You can buy a cheaper one. And then, of course, the Internet is more and more broadband, and it's faster and faster. So the big breakthrough, of course, is going to be uh, 5G, which is radically going to change the, the phone business because it's so fast and so easy that... Uh, you'll be able to live stream from anywhere. That's a real game changer. Can you get in a bit more detail on what 5G is? 5G is, um, you will get the equivalent of one gigabit uh, per second uh, on your phone uh, from uh, uh, from towers. Mm -hmm. You won't need cable anymore. It's probably the end of of cabling wired into your house and Wi-Fi. And um, And when is this going to happen? Well, uh, Verizon is starting this year, and I think Spectrum is also starting this year. So the technology is coming online very, very quickly. From my perspective, I think the great game changer is going to be in terms of live streaming. So, for example, um, NBC paid billions of dollars for the Olympics. But if you go to the Olympics or you go to a concert or something, you see thousands of people with their phones. With 5G, all those people will be able to stream the uh, the, the Olympics or the concert live. To oh, the musicians are going to hate you well, it's, because it's, they're not going to get royalties. That's correct. It's techni- and, and also, the ABC is not going to be able to charge anybody to watch the show, and advertisers won't pay because you'll see it anywhere. Can so, we add commercials to our uh, iPhone <laughs> videos? Prop, that's an interesting idea. You probably could. So to me, this is the, you know, you, you know the, the, the notion of, of creative destruction, and this is going to be a classic example. Who's the ideal reader of your book? Well, when we started, originally when I started, we trained journalists, and that was the beginning. And then newspapers got into it, and we did the newspapers. And then as the technology got better and better and percolated out to more and more people, more and more people did it. And I was always unsure about who would sign up for the courses. And and ironically, um, they run the spectrum from, I had a 12-year-old kid who did it who's now shooting his own films. He's about 19 or 20. And then um, I'll tell you a very interesting story. Um, I gave a speech once in Chicago, and uh, uh, after I gave the speech, somebody called me up and said, I want you to, our CEO wants to meet with you. I said, okay, great. So, no, I'm happy to meet any CEO that looks like business, but this was in Baltimore. So I went to Baltimore, and this guy picked me up at the train station, and we started driving, and, and pretty soon, I didn't know who we were gonna talk to. And you know, it's like you go on a date and it's too late to ask the name mm-hmm. because you're too far in. So I thought, I'll figure it out when we get there. So we drive and he goes, now we're on the campus. And I thought, it's a tech firm, it's a biomed, something like big buildings and stuff. And he said, this is the administration building, I went, great. So we went in, I went up in the elevator and there was a giant room with a big conference table and video screens everywhere. And in the corner, there was a yacht, a model of a yacht in glass. And I thought, good, the rich guy. And uh, this guy came out with the, in deck shoes with little glasses around his neck and I thought, this is my guy. And he goes, Mr. Rosenblum. So I did the whole rap democratizing thing, and we can teach. I still had no idea what business he was in. We can teach you <laughs> people. At the end, he said, Pat, uh, let's make a deal with Mr. Rosenblum. I like this a lot. Then he said, have you seen the facility? I went, no. So he said, Pat, show him the facility. I still didn't know what he did for a living. So we walked through this tunnel, and suddenly we got in this other building. There were people with, with walkers and with oxygen and in wheelchairs. Uh, he, his name was John Erickson, and he had the largest chain of retirement communities in the East Coast. Erickson Retirement Homes, and I had dedicated to him that I would train all of his um, uh, uh, clients or inmates to shoot their own video and make their own stuff. So I started to run the boot camps at all the retirement communities. These you people, keep them engaged. Yes, well, the, uh, those that have anything to do all day, mm-hmm. and they love to watch television. So actually, we, we taught five or six of his communities, and we, taught, uh, we ran the boot camps, and at the end of a couple, every month I would go for screenings, and of course, a thousand people, two thousand people would show up, and we'd show the video, and most of them were terrible. I mean, they have a vase of flowers for 10 minutes. And so you don't get a focus group like this every day. So uh, I went to the group and I said... Were they hoping the, the flowers would wilt? Yeah, I, it's, it's, what they, it's, it's what they wanted to see. Mm-hmm. So I, I stood up in front of the group and I said, you've all seen the stuff your friends made. And they went, yes. And I said, you see what's on television? Because they watch television about eight hours a day. Yes. I said, what do you like better? He goes, we like our stuff better. I said, how come? He said, television is too fast. So I went to Erickson, and I said, there's something here. 
So we created something called Retirement Living TV, which you may have seen. It's about 40 million homes. And that's how it got started, because we unleashed people to tell the stories they wanted to see. We didn't need focus groups. We didn't need producers. We didn't need anything. That's democratization. And in time, I'm assuming they got better and better at telling stories. Oh, yeah. No, they got, they got very... Everyone gets... Well, not everyone, but it's, it's, it's like print, you know? J.K. Rowling was, was a citizen journalist. I mean, she didn't work for Bertelsmann. She wasn't an employee of a major media company. If we ran the world of print the way we run the world of television, J.K. Rowling would say, I have an idea for a, a book I want to write. And they go, well, J.K., you know, maybe you can get a job at, 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 at Random House as a receptionist, and you work your way up, and you become an assistant editor, an associate editor. And she goes, no, no, I got this idea for this kid. He's got a thing on his head. He's like, they go, forget it. <laughs> but now we've unleashed millions of people. Most of it's going to be junk, but some of it's going to be really good. You've called your book iPhone Millionaire. Mm. Can people really make millions using the that's phone? A, iPhone? That's a funny story also. Um, I didn't want to call it that originally. I had a much more esoteric title about the social ramification of the democratization of media. And I, nobody wanted to buy it. And so uh, Mark Bittman, you know, the New York Times guy, mm -hmm. is an old friend of mine. I've known him for years. And I said, Mark, I can't sell my He's book. mostly talking about food. Yeah, total, all food. All you call those cookbooks. But I've known him for a million years. And he's a nice guy. And so I said, Mark, I can't sell my book to anybody. He said, go see Angela, my agent. She'll take care of you. Well, of course, Bittman has put Angela's kids through college. He's the best-selling cookbook in America. So she agreed to have lunch with me. And we met at some restaurant. And even before the menus came out, she said, I read your proposal. I can't sell it. Nobody will buy this. I said, oh, you're not going to sit with her for lunch. And she says, give me something I can sell. So I was so annoyed. I took out my phone. I put it down on the table. I said, I can show you how to make a million dollars with this thing. And she goes, that mm. I can sell. And two weeks later, I had the contract with McGraw Hill. So, But do, can people actually, well, yes. Well, maybe. Thousands. I can. <laughs> <laughs> you can. You got a big name. You got a big following. You could make a million dollars with this. That's not that hard to do. Talking about food, didn't you work with Anthony Bourdain? Yes. I was. Uh, that's a, an interesting story also. Somewhere along the line, um, some Wall Street guys came to me, and they said, you should have your own group of video journalists who was training everybody else. So we went out and raised a couple of million dollars. Nick Nicholas, who was the, then the chairman and CEO of Time Life, was my anchor investor. And uh, he introduced me to all his photographers from Life who he was firing, and he said, you can have these guys. So I had these fantastic people who I tried to do video. And... Um, and we started to, I set up this company called Video News International, and I had 100 video journalists around the world making stuff. And um, I sold that to the New York Times and uh, became, I, uh, Punch Sulzberger bought it, the, the idea of taking them into video. And I became the president of New York Times Television. Well, the funny thing was, as soon as I became the president of New York Times Television, Joe Lelyveld, who was the managing editor, said, Welcome to the Times. He took me to lunch. He said, Welcome to the Times. Glad to have you here. Just a couple of things. You can't go near the newsroom. You can't use the name New York Times. You can't have any of my reporters, and I don't want to see anything. Great. Woo. Well, and then, you know, it, it's like when, you, when you're a tourist and when you're... So I was no longer a tourist. And Did I just, he see you as competition? Do you think I, that he, people in the business see you as competition? They saw me as degrading the brand. Mm -hmm. And Lily Vell said to me very prou prou proudly, I don't have a television. I don't watch television. I don't believe in it. They saw it as degrading. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I had to go to these monthly meetings with, with the, the management, and they would look at the balance sheet. they go, well, you know, I have no income. I said, I got I got stuff. So we started to, I put some of my guys in hospital emergency rooms, and we did this fantastic series called Trauma Life in the ER, which we sold to TLC. And, and then I read Bourdain's. We, we ran about eight or nine series simultaneously. It took off because it was so cheap. You put four kids with video cameras in a hospital emergency room. They, it was the same thing. It was the intimacy. You'd get people shot in the head and all that stuff. And then I read Bourdain's book, um, and so I went down to see him, and I thought, well, this guy could make TV. So we did a pilot, and then um, we sold it to the Food Network, and it ran for two years. And then they canceled. And so I thought, eh, Tony, you're a nice guy, I see you. But um, the editor who worked on it, Lydia Tanaglia, and her boyfriend, who she married, Chris Collins, formed a company with Bourdain, and they started No Reservations. And that's when the thing really took off. And CNN... Oh, I mean, they, they, I mean, Bourdain was fantastic. and, and they well, Was it shot it. the same way? Uh, well, obviously it wasn't using, they weren't no, using they didn't a camera. Use, they used, they, they, they weren't they using used, my phone. Chris was a cameraman. He had a fantastic yeah. eye. No, it wasn't done by phone. It was done with big gear. Yeah. Now, I interviewed Anthony Bourdain maybe five or six times mm -hmm. over the years, starting from when he was really unknown, when right. his book was first published. And it came, I was stunned when I heard that he'd committed mm. suicide. He seemed like the least oh, sure. likely he person was, to commit suicide. I, had, I, I, I did another series with him for Travel Channel. We created something called Travel Channel Academy, 
and uh, we trained several thousand Travel Channel viewers to shoot their own video. And then Tony was going to host the series. He's the nicest guy in the world. I was just astonished. So I never expected it. Now, are there certain skills that people need to make good video? Uh, you have a, a what you call a five-shot method. Yes, right. It's um, a, As I told Jan Stenbeck 35 years ago, any idiot can do this, mm -hmm. and any idiot can do it. It's I've created a formula. There's still hope for me, though. You know, <laughs> I'm telling you, come down. I, 50% off for you. <laughs> Take the course. So um, if you follow the rules that I gave you, anyone can shoot perfect video every single time. There's sev several elements to great video. First is the discipline and the shooting. Um, most in the industry, most people shoot 20 to 1 or 30 to 1. That's standard industry ratio, which means 95% of what you shoot is a waste of time. So we strive for one-to-one -one shooting. You go into a situation, you see exactly what you need. I need that, I need that, I need that. Then you shoot it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 5, 1, 2, 3, 5. Two sound bites from you, one sound bite from you, and we're done. And then it drops on the timeline, and you're finished. The, the other great element that makes great stories is we're very character-driven. I'm not interested in essays. I want personal stories, intimate personal stories. And finally, it's this notion of arc of story, which I stole from Hollywood. What makes Hollywood movies great is you wait. There's internal tension, and you want to find out what happens in the end. So those are the elements that we teach people. And, of course, some people are excellent, some people are okay, and some people are terrible. Do you enjoy teaching? I love to teach. So you've pretty much given up going out and shooting things. You, yes. the, the, you, the, if there's a new Intifada, you're not going to be there. No, no. I, I, well, I'm already I'm 64 years old, so I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. But, um, yeah, I, I love to teach. It's my favorite thing. I taught at Columbia Journalism School for eight years until they threw me out. And then I taught at NYU uh, Journalism School for eight years until they threw me out of there. And now I'm teaching at Oxford. My wife and I are going to be teaching at Oxford University in England this summer, starting this summer. So I love teaching. It's fantastic. Should people try to shoot in HD, in, in 4K? Everyone shoots. If you're using a phone, you're shooting in HD and 4K. It's an abstraction. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, no, it's no longer a barrier. It's standard. It's industry standard. Well, what's standard. next? Virtual reality? Augmented reality? I've seen augmented. I'm not a big... I may be too old for this, but, I, you know, putting funny hats and faces on people, to me, doesn't really advance the story, <laughs> but that, that may be what people like. So you're not going to be writing iPhone Millionaire's Guide to VR or uh, AR? Unlikely, no. no I, I, I think that the, the, the area I'm very interested in, it's, it's very interesting... Um, I, I, apply, I, I went to summer school at Oxford for six summers. It's my hobby, and I studied modern European history. But being very entrepreneurial, I started to talk to the university after the third year about, well, you know, we could teach a course here, and we'll split the fees with you, and that kind of stuff. And Oxford's a good brand. And uh, f they don't have a film school. They don't have a media studies thing. And finally, I think I annoyed them so much that they, they took my wife and me into the faculty as adjuncts. And uh, this summer we're teaching a course, but we're associated with the religion department because they don't have film. So I said, great, we'll do it. It's going to be iPhone filmmaking. And they said, we'd like to make one small change. We want to call it using modern media for the common good. Can we do that? I went, great. And then I thought, well, we have to make a curriculum that reflects that. And suddenly I started to think about all the things, the potential that you could do with this unleashed medium, not to make more fires and car crash and stuff like that, but rather to change the nature of how the medium interacts with people. And that's really what I'm interested in. So that's what you're teaching your boot camp? Yes. Okay, if somebody's listening right now yes. and says, gee, this is for me, Yes. what do they do? Well, the, the best thing to do is we have an online school called thevj.com. And if they go to thevj.com, they can sign up. It's a 10-day free trial. And then any listener that you have can get a discount. My wife made me write down the discount code, which is VJ20 when they go sign up. We run these in-person boot camps. We're doing one in March. We still have a few places there. We do those. We have an office on top of the Museum of Modern Art, so that's where we're going to do those. And then this summer... Uh, how many people in a typical class? Probably about 20. Mm -hmm. And uh, then this summer, we're doing uh, the, the first uh, Using Modern Media for the Common Good at uh, Oxford University. And if anybody's interested in that, they should just go to the VJ.com and get in touch with me. And uh, is, are there things in your boot camp that aren't in the book? Yes. Oh, yes. I, I, since, since the book was written... We've the, the the mentality and the approach has, has changed even more radically. Uh, how many people have you trained so far? Our last, like McDonald's, we stopped counting at around <laughs> fifty thousand, but we always say fifty thousand. And do you know if any of your students have sold programs? Oh, way? many, many have gone on to great careers, and and so well, uh, like the Samson Styles just sold it to his film to Revolt. Some have made you know feature films. Nobody's breaking into Hollywood yet, but yeah, you know, we've got people all over the world who've been doing this. You have uh, another website 
that's www rosenblum b uh, that's r o s e n b l u m t v yes dot com yes how is that different from uh, the vg dot com the, the vj the dot com is vj a, or vg vj video oh. journalist the vj dot com I, I that, wrote it wrong that's okay the um, the vj dot com is our online school and that's all the there were, there were, we have one thousand two hundred separate video lessons. Rosenblum TV is kind of the parent site, and that talks more about the, the training and, and the, the boot camps and stuff like that. But either one works for me. And I'm assuming that as time goes on, you keep on learning new things yes. and you impart that yes. to your I students. Mean, what is the latest thing that I should know if I want to really be the hippest uh, iPhone journalist that there is? Uh, don't move the camera. It's <laughs> 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 the great mistake everyone makes. I, I can't believe, you know, sometimes you, you see these things on television and the, uh, you think, That's did the guy movie. fall down? Well, the interesting thing is we always say that the most compelling filmmaking is one that matches the way you see the world yourself. So I have a great uh, thing that we do with some of our people. We'll blindfold you and take you to some place you've never been before and take off the blindfold and ask you to observe how you see something for the first time. I'm sure you, you've been mm. to the Grand Canyon, right? Yes, I have. But you've seen a million National Geographic things where they pan across the Grand Canyon really slowly. There's a voice that goes, the Grand Canyon, mm. like that. But when you went to the Grand Canyon, you didn't stand on the edge and go, Whoa. No, I didn't do a slow pan. No, no. You see people in, in Times Square who, who take their, their, their phones and they wave it all over the place. But when they look at Times Square themselves, not, unless they have a neurological issue, they don't <laughs> walk around like this all the time. <laughs> So we always say, <laughs> the more you can replicate the way you see the world, the more the viewer will feel like they're in the moment. My desire in the filmmaking is to make the viewer feel like they are there themselves. And since we have become so accustomed to cuts, yes. you, you show a thing, yes. and then you cut to another yes. thing, and you cut to another thing, there's yes. no need to do the pan. No, I, 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 we, we don't like to move it at all. And the funny thing is that the, the, the edits, the best edits are the ones you don't feel. And so, for example, if you go, if I blindfold you and I took you to Times Square, for example, I took off the blindfold, you'd see, you'd see the whole thing, but then you would see a sign, you would mm -hmm. see someone's face, you'd see someone walk across the street, things. but your brain laces it together in a kind of fluidity, and it seems, you don't seem like jumpy, cut, 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 even though you are not panning back and forth, and that's what we try to replicate in terms of the grammar of, of editing. Michael Rosenblum, uh, he has a boot camp, a and uh, he also has a book called iPhone Millionaire from McGraw-Hill. And it has been my great pleasure to talk with him today on Leonard Lopin at Large. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Leonard. It was terrific. And that brings us to the end of our show. My great thanks to Michael Rosenblum, to Jessica Brockington, who produced this segment, to Charlie Morrow, who composed our theme music, and to my executive producer, Jesse Lent, who is at the audio controls today. What a little and large comes to you on Saturdays at 4 and Tuesdays at noon. You can subscribe to Leonard Lopate at Large podcast on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site, which is robinhoodradio.com. You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>